You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. So welcome to episode 283. And in this episode, I interviewed Nate Gruner. Nate is a staff behavioral therapist at the McLean OCD Institute. And in this episode, we talk about his therapy story. We talk about functional analytic psychotherapy, or FAP for short. We talk about the interpersonal aspects of therapy, the importance of the therapeutic relationship, how FAP can be useful for OCD. He gives client in-session examples, using FAP, ACT and ERP together, doing exposures to build intimacy. We discuss clinically relevant behaviors and much, much more. A different episode, really interesting. Uh, I think you're going to get a lot out of it. And thanks to NoCD for supporting the show. NoCD are dedicated to creating a better everyday life for people with OCD. They now operate in the US, UK and Australia. To find out more, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. As always, thank you to you guys for listening. I deeply appreciate it. And without further ado, here is Nate. Welcome to the show, Nate. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you here. And uh, I always like to get, if I get a clinician on, just to hear their therapy story. So what got them into doing this work and then specifically working with OCD? So I originally um, was studying psychology undergrad um, at Brandeis University, which is right near McLean Hospital. And my advisors there said, if I really wanted to find out if I want to be a clinician to go work at McLean. So I went to the eating disorders unit first, and I did a couple years there, and then transitioned over to the OCD Institute back in like 2007. Um, Worked a couple years there as a entry level counselor Went to grad school, um, came back, did a fellowship at the OCD Institute, and then I've been working there full time as a behavior therapist since like 2011. So I've been doing this full time for about 10 years. Wow. Yeah, so it's quite a while now. And yeah, what was it that kind of drew you towards OCD? You know, I feel like... um, it's such a universal problem, just OCD and anxiety in general, that I feel like I could relate to it in my own life, just in being someone who tends to run kind of anxious, um, but just really felt interested in the variety um, of the presentation of anxiety and OCD. Um, And then having a really effective treatment like exposure therapy made me really interested. And then once I started getting trained in that and saw how effective it was, I think I just got sort of sold on the idea of doing treatment for OCD. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And as we discussed earlier, um, use ERP, use acceptance and commitment therapy, and you also use uh, FAP. Obviously, no one Google that because it has another meaning, but uh, it's called functional analytic psychotherapy. Um, And that's what we're we're largely going to talk about today because it's not really been discussed on the podcast. Um, So, yeah, let's start off kind of initially kind of real top line. What is functional analytic psychotherapy? And then just in more detail, technical detail that you want to give. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So it's essentially interpersonal behavior therapy, meaning it's a behavioral approach to dealing with the interpersonal part of therapy. So I think historically, cognitive behavioral therapists have tried to generally stay away from dealing with the therapeutic relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, Essentially, it's been be supportive, be kind, be motivational, kind of like a a football coach. Um, And at the OCDI, when I was getting trained here, I was really taught you don't need to have a great relationship with the patient. You just need to have a good enough relationship to get them to do the exposures. And then that's really all they need to get better. But as I started to get more training and do more work with more complex OCD cases, I realized that if 50% of what therapy is, 
is dealing with the intrapersonal uh, behaviors. So like the, the obsessions that they're struggling with and the anxiety and all that stuff. The other 50% is the interpersonal behaviors. And I was mostly ignoring those for a lot of my career because again, my training was more in dealing with the intrapersonal part of, of therapy. I think the CBT community has in general and the OCD community has ignored dealing with the therapeutic relationship. There was a plenary talk that was given at the like 2017, maybe OCD conference by Chad Wetterneck, mm -hmm. where he did a whole thing on FAP and it still has not caught on at all. So there's like a couple people in the community, including me, who I think have been pushing more for this kind of work. Um, but just getting back to your question. So FAP is an interpersonal behavior therapy that focuses on targeting behaviors that the client is doing in session that cause problems in the therapeutic relationship. And those same problems we assume cause problems in their life outside of therapy. Mm -hmm. So we're targeting those behaviors in session, and then we're trying to help them learn new interpersonal behaviors um, and reinforcing those behaviors naturally to create better therapeutic relationship and then better relationships in their life outside. I can go into the details of all of that, but it's really targeting the interpersonal part of therapy. Yeah, I like that. And, and just to clear up some terms, um, so it intra Intrapersonal. Intra so, so um, internal. And then the other one was relational, interpersonal yeah, relation. Yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, yeah, I just, yeah, I just wanted to clear that up. But no, it's really interesting because, yeah, the, 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 the countless studies that talk about the therapeutic relationship and how important that is across therapy modalities, right? But yet, in some, sometimes we have forgotten it. Uh, and it's, yeah, which was why I was smiling when you were telling what you were taught um, before you decided to go down this route. Uh, yeah, the other thing that comes up for me, because FAP isn't an area I've uh, been trained in, um, but I, something that I use is like the here and now relationship. So I do bring up, and not just with OCD, with all, all population I work with, that what's going on in, in our relationship, mine and the client's, is symbolic of what will happen outside, be that a, a positive relationship or a negative. Um, so this is, a, this is an interesting framework for me to understand another way of, of what's going on. So um, it's a really simple question, not so well, not simple, but generic, general, which is how might this be useful for OCD? So uh, let me give you a... I'll give you a case example, something that um, this came up a couple years ago, and I have a lot of these examples, but I'll go with one for now. Um, so a uh, patient came to the OCD Institute where I work, um, this is maybe about five years ago, with a very typical kind of OCD presentation. She was in college um, in New York City. And she developed this fear that there was a substance um, in her bedroom that was going to give her arsenic poisoning. Mm -hmm. And she stopped doing her schoolwork. She really stopped functioning. She called her parents. They moved her to a different, um, a different apartment and then a different apartment and then a different apartment to get away from her contamination fears. And it got all the way to the point where she ended up at um, she did outpatient treatment, I think first for OCD and then came to McLean. So she gets to me and she's telling me about all of this. And it sounds like a very classic presentation of OCD, really just fears of contamination. But as I'm listening to her, I'm doing what we call more of a functional analysis, which is part of what we need to talk about when we're talking about FAP. By the way, functional analysis is part of all good OCD treatment, all good behavior therapy, but Really what functional analysis is, is understanding what's happening before the behavior occurs, what the behavior is, and what's happening after the behavior occurs to understand what's driving the behavior. So for example, if I raise my hand right now on this interview, you're probably gonna assume that I'm trying to get your attention. 
But if I raise my hand in a restaurant, it's more like I'm getting the waiter's attention. Or if I'm raising my hand in a gym, I might be stretching. Mm. So understanding the purpose of a behavior, you need to understand the context. And this is something that I think gets ignored a lot, even in OCD treatment, is we get so focused on the content of the person's symptoms and what they're telling us that we forget to zoom out and look at what's driving all of this. So anyways, as I'm meeting with her, she's saying to me, you know, this all happened when school started getting really hard. Um, finals were coming up. And developing this OCD problem shifted her attention away from finals over to something that she could obsess about and then was able to take a medical withdrawal from school and go focus on this OCD problem. So she starts doing behavior therapy for OCD and outpatient treatment and then now at McLean, and I'm getting to know her as she's talking about this, and she's saying it got her out of school. And another thing is she really wanted a boyfriend, and she was very desperate, I think, in general for connection at school, but she was incredibly shy and had a lot of social anxiety. And so another thing the OCD distracted her from was having to deal with all of that, because if she was going to deal with it, she was going to have to put herself at risk and start talking to people and so on. And she told me in classes where she felt there was someone in the class, a guy that she might want to talk to, she would actively look away from him or like even sometimes be mean to him as a way to sort of preemptively not have to deal with forming connection. With people. So as she's telling me all of this, I'm realizing she has an OCD problem but she really has a fear of failure with her schoolwork. Um, she, she was, as I asked her more about that, she said, I really want to write for the New Yorker, but she can't even write a paper right now for, you know, her final exams. So I'm noticing a fear of failure, a fear of kind of making herself vulnerable with her schoolwork, a fear of making herself vulnerable interpersonally with guys that she might be interested in. And then a, a distraction towards the OCD symptoms as a way to not have to deal with all of that stuff. So as I'm talking to her, zooming out, getting a sense of the picture here, and then I'm doing contamination exposures with her, I start realizing this isn't really about contamination. This is about a fear of being vulnerable in her life. So instead of telling her that, which by the way, as we continue, I can tell you more about when you might even tell the patient this, Instead of telling her that, I did some exposure therapy for the contamination fears, but mostly what I worked on with her was teaching her how to be vulnerable with me. So when she talked about wanting to write for the New Yorker or wanting to have a boyfriend, I started to get very curious about those things and share sort of positive feelings I had for her. I would say things to her like, I was looking forward to seeing you today or, um, you know, I'm really excited to read your writing. And sometimes she would even share her writing with me. Then she developed a crush on one of the male counselors in our program at the OCDI. And instead of just saying, oh, that's inappropriate, you can't have a crush on someone here, blah, blah, blah. I said, let's have you share that with him. And I coached him on how he was going to respond in a way that would be very like flattered and genuine, but also we're not going to have a relationship. But I would love to go pursue relationships back in New York incredibly triggering for her to share with him that she had a crush on him, but now exactly right in the fear of vulnerability area that I wanted to go with her. Now, here's what's interesting about this kind of case. I start targeting the vulnerability stuff through my relationship with her, through her relationship with counselors and other people. We're starting to practice it with her family. The OCD symptoms start going away. Now, in behavioral terms, we would call that differential reinforcement, where we're no longer reinforcing her OCD behaviors, we're reinforcing her vulnerability behaviors. And everything that was driving the OCD, including the rituals, but more importantly, the talk about her OCD, the focus on her OCD, the ERP for her OCD, when we stop focusing on that, those behaviors start going away. And what we start focusing on instead is the vulnerability behaviors, the more interpersonal behaviors. We send her back to New York City. 
she gets a she gets a boyfriend. Um, she, life is going great. She's back in school. Finals roll around, and she goes right back to her old ways. She develops a new obsession now about getting HIV. Um, why? Because she's still got all that fear of kind of putting herself on the line when it comes to her writing and just being being vulnerable with her more kind of uh, academic career pursuits. Comes back to McLean. And this time I started being more direct with her and saying, I don't think you have an OCD problem. I think you have a vulnerability problem. So I started actually talking about this with her. Mm-hmm. And, she, and, and essentially the work with her became on self-honesty about what she was really afraid of and what she was afraid of putting on the line in her life and what she really wanted. Now this has act kind of ideas in it. You're hearing sort of values talking here, but the vulnerability piece is what we focused on sort of exclusively in the treatment. We dropped the focus on the OCD this time. And now her OCD is basically gone, but what we're left with is working on vulnerability. And I can give you many more examples of this kind of thing, but that's just kind of an intro to this. Yeah, no, that that's really interesting. Um, I'm smiling as you tell it. So I didn't tell you earlier, this isn't video. We only do audio, but um, so I'm telling the audience I'm smiling because they can't see my face. But I guess, uh, I mean, it's a really interesting case example. And, uh, you know, so many people will say that the the content, Reed Wilson explicitly says the content of the four is trash. Um, Most, I'm sure most CBT therapists pretty much all of them would agree that there's no meaning to the thoughts. You're still effectively saying that. Um, but a lot of the time the conversation ends with the thoughts are just meaningless. This is something that's going on in your brain. Let's do exposure or whatever it is to overcome it. But you're actually saying, you know, hang on a minute that the, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's, well, this is largely how I view OCD, that it's maybe, a coping mechanism for something else in the case of this this girl it was vulnerability and and all these uh, interpersonal relationships and ocd was maybe her way of gaining some control around a very scary situation um i did a podcast the other day with someone where i shared something that my counselor said to me like five years ago uh when my view at the time of ocd was no it's a biological thing something's gone running my brain kind of that's it and I wasn't seeing this counselor for OCD and she kind of suggested that um, it was my way of coping as a young kid with situations that I couldn't cope with. It was my way. Yeah. And at the time I thought she was nuts. Like there's no way, you know, now I kind of agree with her. I'm not saying I'm still, I haven't, I'm not concrete on this, but I guess hearing you say this is kind of saying the OCD is, is a coping me- mechanism or a symbol for something much deeper. Is that kind of true? Yeah, so I love that you're bringing that up. So there are some cases, and I want to make sure people really get this, where the problems that people come in with really just are OCD, and they really just are intrapersonal problems, meaning I have a like I have a guy right now who has obsessions about when he wakes up in the morning, if he doesn't get out of bed with the right thoughts and the right feelings, his day is going to be ruined. Okay. Now there may be other things driving that, but the treatment that he needs is really exposure and response prevention and maybe some act ideas blended in there. And that's going to be my focus with him. But when the presentation has more of these interpersonal elements um, and you're zooming out and doing a really careful functional analysis, like I was describing to figure out what's driving all of this, then like you're saying, I would say there's a fairly large percentage of OCD cases where if you just treat their symptoms and you don't treat the context in which the symptoms are happening, mm-hmm. you're not actually doing effective treatment. And one, one comment on this is when you're on like listservs or Facebook groups for OCD communities, there's like a big one on Facebook right now. And you see people throwing things out like, I have a case that has this symptom and this symptom and this symptom, and I'm wondering which treatment I should use for this and which exposure I should do. And so one of the jokes I have with some of my colleagues now who are also interested in FAP is like, how could you weigh in on a case like that without knowing the whole context first? You get what I mean? Yeah. And I understand that people are saying, I just want to know what exposure to do, but 
I can't really weigh in on cases now until I know a lot more about what the person is like interpersonally, what's going on in their life outside of their OCD, because without full context, the treatment doesn't make any sense. You have to understand all of that to know what the treatment would be. Yeah, I, yeah, I 100% agree with you. I only work with children and adolescents, and but the, I, if I get someone who's presenting as having OCD, I still want to know everything as much as I can about their family, their situation, their past, if possible, you know, the schooling, whatever it is, to try and see everything and then make a choice and decision on what's actually going on here, not just they have OCD, you know, because there could be some real scary factors, abusive even, that if I'm not addressing that, you know, yeah. I can work on the OCD. But one, one more thing on this that I wanted yeah. to mention, I actually stole this um, analogy from Steve Hayes, who I know you've had on before. Yeah. But, um, so one thing that's happening in the field right now, this is in the CBT field, but I think more generally in the psychotherapy field, is there's a movement in the direction towards what we're calling process-based therapy. And I think it'd be great to have some people on to talk about this, but What process-based therapy is, is instead of having treatment protocols like ERP to target specific psychological problems like OCD, you're instead doing a functional analysis of what's going on with the specific person in front of you Mm -hmm. and developing a treatment plan based on that thing, based on that functional analysis. So instead of protocols for syndromes, It's a carefully tailored treatment plan for the person in front of you. And now I know a lot of people are thinking, oh, yeah, I already do that. But here's where I think people don't realize it. So Hayes gives this example. He's the developer of ACT for people who don't know this, um, where he says a lot of clinicians actually, they reach a point in their training where they've learned ERP or cognitive therapy or ACT or whatever. And they hit a point where they're not getting better. And the reason they're not getting better is it's essentially like someone shooting baskets with a blindfold on and earmuffs on. So if you gave someone a basketball and you had them shoot at the hoop with earmuffs on and blindfold on, they they don't know when the ball's going in. So they could shoot a thousand times and they wouldn't get any better. Meaning ERP, 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 act, act, act. And for a while in my career, that's how I was treating people was just doubling down metaphors, more metaphors, try this, try that, different exposures, what other exposures could I try? But when you take the blindfold off and you take the earmuffs off, you can then start paying attention to when the ball's going in and when it's not going in. So essentially what therapy becomes when you do that is you try an intervention, you watch how it lands, you make adjustments. Try something, watch how it lands, make adjustments. Now, if you said, is that ERP? Is that ACT? Is that prolonged exposure? Is that cognitive therapy? What is that? I'm saying it's it's borrowing from any intervention, but it's no longer tightly linked to just one protocol. It's tailored to the person in front of you based on the functional analysis of that person. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. how the interventions are landing for that person. Yeah. I, absolutely. I think, yeah, spot on. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, my training is integrative because I personally feel you need many different modalities because each individual needs something different and you need a combination or whatever it is. And you need to be able to know how to intertwine and merge and, and as you say, adjust on the spot of what's landing, what isn't. So many times I do stuff and I can see on my client's face, this has not landed in any way and I have to adjust. Um, yeah. And so you see one of the things you see in the ERP community and the OCD community and in the ACT community and in the DBT community and any psychotherapy community is I'm an ACT therapist or I'm an ERP therapist or I'm an OCD therapist. Yeah. And the problem is when you box yourself in, you stop being a process-based therapist, meaning you're no longer tracking how your interventions are landing and you become fairly dogmatic in how you do your treatments. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Therapist number one, and then everything else secondary, you know, my personal opinion should never be anything before the word therapist other than human or parent, maybe, or, you know, but not a specific therapy. I've always, I've always, we get blinded by 
again, this has come up on the podcast recently a couple of times around ERP. It's, it's very effective for many people, but it's not a panacea. It doesn't work 100% of the time. And if we just call ourselves ERP therapists, then we're, we're blinded by its, its, its success rate and not by its faults, or we don't see the faults. And it's about seeing it for what it is as a very good intervention, but seeing its flaws too. And how can we add things in, merge things, adapt, whatever it is. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Now, thank you for raising. So, um, one of my questions was at what point is, is, do you use inter, intertwine FAP in your treatment? But I'm guessing you're trying it from the get go or in using it from the get go is just part of who you are as a therapist or is there specific times that you kind of think now I need to bring it in? This is a great question. So, um, when I, so when I've been training, um, clinicians and we have people coming through the OCDI getting trained, they'll watch me do sessions. And some of them will say, Oh, this was a FAP session. You did all FAP today. And some of them are like, Oh, this was an ACT session. You just did all ACT. Or this was an ERP session. You just did ERP. I'm using FAP only when the interpersonal behaviors are what I think is driving a lot of what they're struggling with. Um, if someone really just has OCD and the rest of their life is going well, they don't struggle with vulnerability. Um, their social skills are relatively good. We'll talk more about what I mean by social skills, but the other things in their life are going well, and they just have an OCD problem in one area of their life. Then I just do ERP. Sometimes I don't even do act. I'm just doing ERP and that's it. Keep it simple. Um, but when they come in and it's more like the girl I described where it's like a fear of vulnerability is driving most of their symptoms, then I'm going fat pretty early on from the beginning. Mm. Um, so it's, you have to be able to read, like I was saying before, what is driving this person's problems? Um, I'll give you another example. Yeah, please. I recently treated someone who had a tick disorder and so when she came into treatment, she was doing all kinds of tick behaviors right from the beginning in, in like the first session, like sort of leaning her head back, doing all kinds of behaviors. I don't want to get too specific just for confidentiality reasons, but as she was doing it and I'm sort of doing my functional analysis, asking more about like what's going on in her life. When does this behavior occur? She says, it occurs when I'm getting close to my friends and especially to her romantic partner. That's when the behaviors start increasing. Hmm. And then I have her sort of start getting close to me and I see the ticks starting increasing, meaning emotionally close. We start sharing things about ourselves. And then, you know, I started working on the vulnerability piece with her and the ticks went away to like zero because essentially what we did is we said instead of doing ticks to deal with fears of getting close to people let's start practicing getting emotionally close to people but in ways that are more um effective like sharing how you feel towards me right now like you're feeling anxious but you also feel interested in connecting uh, one thing i did with her is i said I don't think your ticks are your primary problem. And she got very defensive at first. And was let, this could happen with anyone you're dealing with where you say, I don't think this thing that you've been struggling with your whole life is your primary problem. Hmm. Got defensive at first. And then I shared with her like how it felt to, for her to get defensive with me and how it was hard for me to like be brave and say that to her. But I was really doing it because I wanted to have a relationship be about honesty and she started dropping her defenses sort of as I sort of went in that direction. Anyways, if you were graphing her ticks, they went down to zero within like a couple of weeks of treatment. And I wasn't doing any treatment for the ticks. Again, it was that differential reinforcement thing where we're not reinforcing the ticks by focusing on them or doing a treatment for them. Um, so when do I use FAP? It's when I see that the problem is not intrapersonal it's interpersonal hmm. yeah okay yeah that's really interesting another good uh 
uh, case example. Uh, and I, I've heard similar from group supervision. One of my peers shared something similar to that. Not not the work that you did, but like the case example around ticks um, and it being relational. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, what's my next question? God. Yeah, so th this this next sort of four questions are not from me. They're from uh, Patricia and Johnny. So thank you to those guys. So the first one was, uh, how do you do exposures to build intimacy? Good question. Um, if you think about it, like when you're getting close to someone, what kinds of things do you talk about? And okay, so, so here's the thing. When you're doing FAP, it can't be, I'm going to work on being vulnerable with this person as an intervention. So it can't be like, I'm going to make myself vulnerable because I want this person to get better. It just won't land well if that's, it's a technique that you're using. So when I'm doing exposures to build intimacy, I'm going to share something with the patient that is actually going on in my life or in my relationship with them that is meaningful to me or painful for me or something I'm struggling with. And I'll share it with them. And I'm, I'm modeling how to be vulnerable, but I'm also doing it because it's something that's real in my life or it's real in my relationship with them. So I might say something like, I'll talk about like a friend who passed away or like a conflict I'm having with a, a partner, or um, it might be a sense of boredom or frustration that I'm feeling in the relationship that I'm having with the person in front of me. Hmm. Or it might be an excitement I have about the relationship, like a looking forward to seeing them or a closeness that I'm feeling to them. So one thing is, if you think about your life, and by the way, there's a gender difference on this. So women tend to share with their female friends more process-oriented kinds of statements, like, I was looking forward to seeing you. I missed you. It's so nice to be with you right now. Men tend not to say those things as much, so they're not um, socially reinforced for it. It's awkward for them. But what's interesting is I think both genders want that just as much as uh, they both are very interested in it. It's super helpful for them to be able to do that. And the one area where I think you see people often able to do it is in romantic relationships. Men especially are able to usually let go more and share how they're feeling when they're in a romantic relationship as opposed to in other relationships. So in the therapy relationship, I'm often talking about meaningful things, painful things, important things, both in my life and in my relationship with the patient, and then I'm encouraging them to do the same. And as we do it, it becomes in fact what we call naturally reinforcing, meaning the closeness that we start feeling reinforces us to want to share more on things with each other about how we're feeling towards each other and how we're feeling about things that are happening in our lives. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, so naturally reinfor uh, reinforcing as in because it was it was a pleasant experience, I want to do more of this. Is that, yeah. And sometimes it's not even that it's pleasant in the like feels good way. It's more pleasant in the feels genuine way. Yeah. Um, so it could be a painful moment. Yeah, but it's honest. Um, like, it's honest, like... Um, there was one moment with the first girl I described where she did something in her life that was really hard. She had um, gone out to apply for a job at a museum and she was really nervous about the interview. She's, um, she went to the interview and she didn't, she came back, she was telling me about it. And I could see in her face how proud she was of herself and how often she doesn't feel proud of herself. And so as she's saying, and I'm tuning into that and I said, I can just see how genuine you're being with me right now and how just, I rarely get to see that side of you. And she just started tearing up when I said that. And I think it was because she was connecting to this vulnerable part of herself that she usually doesn't share, which is I want 
to have success in my life and I'm afraid to go for it. And now she's going for it and I'm seeing that and I'm sharing that with her. And when she started crying, she said, I don't know why I'm crying. And I said, I think it's because you're doing something that matters to you and you're telling me about it and I'm seeing it. And it's like those moments in therapy, I know this sounds like a little hippy dippy or like psychodynamic when I'm talking about, but these are the behaviors. Like it's a behavior that she's doing this vulnerability behavior that I'm reinforcing by sharing with her the impact it has on me. Yeah. Yeah. No, it doesn't sound hippy dippy to me at all. And I'm perfectly okay. If you would even talk about psychoanalysis, it's a, I'm fascinated by it all. Um, okay, so the next question, I'm going to mention CRB. So if, before you answer the question, you could just explain what those are in a minute. Um, but yeah, the question is, how do you keep track of CRB1 and CRB2? And how do you decide what to evoke and what to reinforce? So CRBs are clinically relevant behaviors. Um, so really all that means is, a CRB1 is a behavior someone does in session that causes problems in the session and that we know probably causes problems in their life outside of the session. Mm -hmm. So a classic one could be um, being, uh, let's take an OCD one, reassurance seeking. Um, so they seek reassurance. Now the typical um, OCD therapist response to reassurance seeking behavior is to educate the patient that reassurance seeking is bad. I'm not going to do that. And then eventually blocking reassurance seeking. Um, but in fact, here's what you would do. You would tell the patient that re reassurance seeking is one of these behaviors that we want to keep our eye on. Mm -hmm. And when they do it, we would point it out. Maybe we might ignore it too, but essentially what we're doing is we're trying to do something that puts that behavior on extinction, meaning decreases the chances that it's going to happen. And then we want to reinforce a CRB2. A CRB2 is a behavior someone does in session that causes improvements in the relationship and improvements in their life outside. So if someone has an urge to seek reassurance, a CRB2 might be hey, I really want to get reassurance right now. But actually, I think I'm feeling just scared about how final exams are going to go. I just wanted to share that with you. Now, there's the CRB2. Why? That's probably going to work well in their life. It's a more vulnerable thing. It's, it's going to land well for me. It's going to land well for other people. And my response to it can simply be, yeah, finals are scary. What are you doing to prepare? Um, and we might shift the conversation in that direction, right? Instead of, do you think I'm going to pass? Do you think I'm going to pass? Like some kind of reassurance seeking behavior around that. So what we're doing in FAP is we're noticing CRB ones. We're either ignoring them or we're punishing them in some way that's essentially decreasing the chances they're going to happen more. And then we're naturally reinforcing CRB twos. By the way, this is something that I think ERP therapists often don't realize is that when you're doing exposure therapy, you really shouldn't just be blocking rituals. You should be blocking rituals, but reinforcing new behaviors that the person is going to do. That's why the ACT approach to exposure yeah. is very much like what values-based behaviors are going to do in the presence of this thing that you're afraid of. FAP is very similar to that where it's not just stopping all these problematic behaviors. It's reinforcing new interpersonal behaviors that are going to work well in the relationship. Mm. Yeah. No, thank you for that. This is a good explanation. Um, uh, yes. The next one question was actually on reassurance and I'm just going to make sure. Yeah. We've answered that one. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is the final question from those guys, which was your advice on working with the relational impacts of OCD, which we have discussed, but if there's anything else you wanted to say. So one thing that I've been doing a lot more, and I feel like 
we should talk about this because it's, it's sort of like a controversial kind of approach, but I, I think it makes sense from the FAP lens, which is, you know, I have a lot of patients who come to the OCDI and they've had OCD for years and they've seen like 10 different therapists. And so their, their focus on OCD is very well rehearsed. And so when they talk about it, it's actually quite boring Um, it doesn't have any life to it. It kind of goes in the same direction every time. It's sort of in a loop. A lot of times what I will do is I will just tell patients, this is boring. Meaning talking about whether or not um, you're going to have sex with your mom um, or whether you're going to harm that kid uh, or whether you left the stove on or whatever. For me, the, now I know as someone who's worked on this stuff for like 10 years, I'm going to be fairly bored with those kinds of conversations because I've heard them over and over. But from a fat perspective, those conversations aren't going to land well anywhere in that person's life, both internally in their head and in other relationships where they share it with people. So a lot of what I'm doing is sharing with them how it lands for me, meaning there's no life to this conversation. And now this sounds insensitive, right? The, the problem you came in with, I find boring. And a lot of interns who've watched me do therapy have said, oh my God, I can't believe you actually said that. Like you said their thing was boring. But then, like I was saying before, I follow it up with, I want to hear more about you. Now, for someone who's been struggling with OCD for like most of their life, sometimes they don't know anything about themselves when you ask them, tell me about your hobbies or your interests or your relationships, whatever. So there actually isn't much to reinforce, meaning they're not going to share much with you that's going to be crb 2 like in nature. And that's where you got to get them out doing things first so they have more interesting things to talk about. But I often share the impact their OCD has on me whether it's reassurance seeking, whether it's trying to figure out some kind of obsession. And when it has a lifeless quality to it, I tell them like, this isn't working for my relationship with you. But I also make sure, and this is something people should be aware of, you need to make sure your relationship with the, with the patient is a reinforcer, meaning they like you enough where if you say that to them, they're gonna wanna shift over to connecting with you in other ways. Because if you're just a punisher, and they, they, then you've lost everything with them. So you have to get a little bit of rapport with them first before you share something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good point. Um, but yeah, what came to me, as you said, it is, yeah, some people would absolutely, or even hearing this probably annoyed by that. But for me, it's to anyone listening, you know, that they're, they're much more than their OCD, even if it's plagued their life, the, the, you know, even that they feel there's, they've got nothing to bring, what they can bring is massive. And I want to hear about that, you know, and, and yeah. And, and I think that's, that's a first step in shifting away from the OCD of, oh, I can do more. I am more than the OCD because it feels like you're nothing but it sometimes when it's yes. so intense. And, and one more thing on that. If clinicians or uh, clients are listening to this and thinking, well, how do I know when it's a productive conversation and when it's not? Hmm. This is actually one of the core components of FAP is process versus content, um, which is similar to interpersonal versus interpersonal. So process versus content. So many OCD therapists make this mistake where they focus on the content of what someone is saying and they forget to track the process. And what I mean by that is, What does it feel like to talk about this thing? Where is this conversation going? Is this moving us in a positive direction, this conversation? And I can't tell you how many conversations I've had where we just were going nowhere, but I was doubling down and trying this metaphor and that metaphor and try this perspective and that. What you really want to do when you're getting stuck in that is shift over to saying things like, this is feeling boring or stuck right now. Um, and then noticing when conversations have life to them and when there's a connection to them, like sometimes in the middle of those, I'll just look at the client and say, I like you, but this isn't why I like you. It's not this, it's something else. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm 
helping them go process in a moment when they're all content. They might look at me and go, but am I going to kill my mom? And I go, it's not that. That's not the thing that you're here for. It's something else. And then I'm waiting for when they give me something that's more process oriented. Like I was looking forward to seeing you or um, I might even just jump in and say something like in the middle of an OCD conversation, uh, I think I want to get a dog. Do you think I should get a dog? Um, just to shift it over to something more process focused. And now I'm going to reinforce whatever they give me there. That's a CRB too. Mm. That's a good, good illustration. Uh, and what just came to me is earlier you mentioned, we'll talk more about social skills. It's just an open invitation now to say whatever. Yeah. So some people might think, oh, this FAP stuff sounds like it's just social skills training. No, I mean, social skills. So just to be clear, FAP yeah. could be used for like the most sophisticated person in the world all the way down to someone who has very poor social skills, meaning they just need to learn eye contact, for example, um, because clinically relevant behaviors are defined functionally, meaning um, someone who's very sophisticated and high functioning in their life might struggle with emotional closeness, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to be working on that behavior. But someone who's struggling with eye contact, we can also do FAP stuff for that, which would look more like classic social skills training. But when they're making eye contact, you might reinforce it naturally by saying, gosh, I feel like I can see you more now. I'm starting to understand you better as you look at me. Hmm. Now I can see what's the emotions that you're having. But social skills training, just in the like talking too much or not enough, um, talking too loudly or too quietly, um, being overly aggressive, talking too much about politics, being too people pleasing, being too assertive. All of these things can be targets in fact, um, because essentially what we're working on is interpersonal behaviors that are gonna create positive relationships for them in their life. But it's much more strategic than just teaching someone how to make eye contact. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, good clarity. I don't think it also, what you've just said kind of, We've been talking about it, but there's, as I said, there's much more going on than just OCD and sometimes, uh, and it's about not just focusing and working on the OCD, even if you do it from a traditional ERP stance, but realizing that the, the individual, if, if they had, don't have good relationships or there's rupture in those relationships, then there's continued problems beyond OCD. And it, yeah, because humans it's, it's, are relational. Yeah, it's, I honestly think it's pretty rare that someone goes to therapy, whether it's for OCD, depression, another problem, and they have really good friendships and romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Usually, if someone's struggling psychologically, it's showing up in their relationships too. So, yeah, I think, mean, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I think for me, that's why we can get blinded by this whole medical model of OCD and I'm not saying there's no biological component but when we think it's only biological we we discount and discard every other factor that may be impacting it which isn't good in my opinion or yours totally it sounds of it yeah uh right so yeah so I did have some questions on act but I think I'll save that for another day with you um just on time so I guess lastly on FAP, is there anything else that you wish you could have shared on that? You know, well, okay. So one thing that I wonder about, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this too, because you've interviewed a ton of people now. So why is it that FAP hasn't caught on? So if you think about this, ERP really started getting popular I would say when I started training at the OCDI in 2007, it was really getting popular, but a lot of outpatient therapists didn't know how to do it. It was more like in kind of hospital OCD settings. Mm. Now, almost everyone coming out of grad school knows something about ERP. 10 years ago, no one knew what ACT was. Almost everyone knows what ACT is now. 
And I'm looking at FAP and I'm going, is FAP going to be like ACT where it's going to come onto the scene and people are going to start realizing this? And I actually don't know the answer. But what I want to say is, I don't think we can proceed as a field saying, we're just going to ignore the therapeutic relationship and just focus on the interpersonal stuff. And we're going to develop more and more exposure techniques and we're going to develop more and more therapies to target OCD and depression and borderline personality disorder. I mean, here at McLean, there's like six different treatments for borderline personality disorder. Mm. So I just don't think the way forward for our field is going to be more protocols, more protocols, more protocols. I think it's going to be something more like I said before, doing a really careful analysis of what's going on with the person in front of you and then trying interventions and seeing how they land for that person and making adjustments. I'm talking about process-based therapy now, which is starting to feel, but I am not sure that the people leading that movement, Steve Hayes, Stefan Hoffman, and probably some people in the OCD community are now seeing this. I don't know if they get that the interpersonal part of therapy is actually going to be 50% of what we're going to have to start targeting. Um, and here's one thing I think about is as I've been getting trained in FAP and learning FAP and doing FAP, it's hard. One of the reasons it's hard is you have to make yourself vulnerable. Um, you have to bring more of yourself into the relationship, into the treatment. Um, it's also hard because there isn't a protocol, meaning it's def- all of the interventions are defined functionally. So if someone, I'll give you an example. If someone comes late for a session and they don't apologize to me, that could be a CRB1, but it could be a CRB2. Here's why. Someone who has people-pleasing problems and they show up late for a session and they don't apologize, that's a CRB2 for that person to not apologize. And it's a CRB1 for someone who has people-pleasing problems. So one of the things that's hard to train people in a therapy where everything you do is defined functionally, because then they can't go look at the protocol to see what to do. You have to essentially teach people how to constantly be analyzing the function of behavior. And I think that scares a lot of clinicians, especially newer clinicians. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts, but I just don't know yet if FAP is going to take hold the way ACT and ERP has. Yeah, really interesting points. Uh, and off the top of my head, a few things that come to mind that have been in my head anyway around other things is one, for me, I feel like the art of psychotherapy is kind of dying off and it's partly dying off because of manualized therapies such as CBT, DBT, any of the BTs, I'm sure. Um, uh, because we've said, this is how you do it. This is what it is. And obviously a lot, I don't want to discredit the great work many ERP therapists do. And they, they, they do, they are very creative with it, but it's still very structured. You're still exposing, you're still um, reducing or stopping the compulsions. And it's obviously much more to that, but it, it's kind of manualized. And for me, like, and also there's this move to look down on people like Freud and Jung and all, even these contemporary psychoanalysts when they had so much training and they were so intelligent and with each individual, they were on the spot trying to figure out what's going on and understand. And it was an art. It wasn't a science, you know? And I think we moved away and went purely scientific. And I think that has been good. And it's also, I think we're now we're seeing the negatives of that. And for me, it's about how do we now go somewhat back in time while keeping the science, move back to people like Jung who were using it more as an art. Obviously, Freud was actually trying to be scientific, but it, for me, it was still an art in how he did it in session. As you're saying, it was completely unique for each individual. That's something I'm very passionate about as, as a practitioner. Um, hence, my, as I said, my training has been in, integrative, so it's been it's hammered into me. Um, that's kind of one aspect. The oh, the other aspect I should say on that there was a study that came out uh, this year, April twenty twenty one, from the U in the UK by some leading sort of psychiatrists who one of them heads up an OCD clinic for the NHS, and so she's vested. I'm sure that clinic primarily uses ERP, um, and the study kind of said that ERP was no more effective than other active therapies. 
And this is looking at 36 randomized control trials of ERP on OCD. Wow. Which was, in my opinion, not great for the purely ERP community. But I think it's something that needed to be said. Um, and, and also, I don't want to discredit anyone doing ERP because it's still very effective. But what they, they, they kind of pulled it off its pedestal a bit which I think it needed to be done, as I said earlier at the start of the interview, so we can then figure out what we can bring in. Is it FAP? Is it ACT? And maybe it's going to be different things. Maybe it's a bit more of a um, person-centered type of therapy alongside ERP, you know, whatever works for the individual, but get creative with that. Um, So I still use ERP, but I bring in other things alongside the ERP. Um, Whereas obviously all the randomized control trials, which is my issue with RCTs, is you're just looking at one very strict thing. So I, I won't say anything more about that, but the study is very interesting. It's by Reed, R-E-I-D et al, 2021. Um, and the other part is thinking about ACT, and Steve Hayes and co have done an incredible job since the 90s, which I think was rough, or it was just before FAP, right? ACT was created, but not much. The first um, FAP book, in, this is again what I'm getting at. The first FAP book yeah. came out. 1991 yeah and the first act book came out in 1999 so fap's been around oh, wow. okay time, but it has not caught hold the way act has so yeah yes good point so they've done acts the act community have done an incredible job at promoting themselves and i remember one of my first lecturers who was he was a trainee he was a therapist but then he was going back to training as an actual psychoanalyst and his view of act therapists was very like almost like it's a hippie convention if you go to one of the like and i think that's why act does a good job they really get people to buy into it the talk of values just resonates with everyone it's it's got that sexy appeal to it um erp has that sexy appeal in the sense of we're going to get you to face your fears you know um fat maybe doesn't have that that unique wow factor that that gets people tied in. So that and another one is like inference-based therapy. So there's been plenty of research on OCD for that in Montreal. Um, that hasn't really taken off. Same, it's probably the same sort of level as um, not inference. I just said inference. But, um, FAP. It's weird how some just take off and some don't. But I, I, I think it's purely just a marketing problem. It it really is, and you know, just everything you just said, I think was spot on. Um, I, I have to say this: sometimes outpatient clinicians will call me when I'm done treating a patient at the OCDI, and we'll do a little conversation about the treatment we did, and they'll say, "What were the ERPs that you did?" And I'll tell them, I'll give them nice descriptions of it. But what I really want to tell them is about the FAP stuff that we did, but I can't. Uh, because not enough people have the language for it. And I would feel like I'd be training them in it, right? Yeah. But I'll say this, because this will sort of take the focus off of me. The best therapists I know in the OCD field and just in general are not ERP therapists. They're not ACT therapists. They're not FAP therapists. They're not DBT therapists. They're more like a blend of these things, like you were describing. Mm-hmm. And if do therapy they know all of these treatments and they're pulling in elements of these treatments but like i'm tailoring them for each moment and how it's going to land and the art of doing therapy is so hard to capture in books it's much easier to capture in videos which is something we've been thinking about more at the ocdi is how to actually like videotape some of the work that we're doing Hmm. it's hard to do that for confidentiality reasons but we really need to get those videos out there for people to see it Um, I think, and I'll recommend some of these people for your show, the best therapists I know are people who are doing more process-based therapy, meaning they're just watching how their interventions are landing and they're making adjustments. They're evidence-based in the sense that they know the the evidence-based treatments, they have them all in their arsenal, but they're process-based in the sense that they're watching how things are unfolding in each moment in the therapy. Yeah. Yeah, now that's interesting. There's some good ideas. Um, yeah, I think it's just a matter of chipping away and, and proving why it's good. And I think um, probably a conversation off air, but it, it's about um, maybe more among the uh, CBT ERP therapists is doing it in a way of, hey, we're not we're not saying ERP doesn't work. We're saying this in addition, you know, so it's not scaring people off. Um, exactly. Yeah. I just 
want to, again, make sure people get that there are some patients, all I do is ERP, all I do is ACT, sometimes all I do is more DBT-like interventions. But again, it's, it's based on what's going on with the person in front of me. It's not, I'm an ERP therapist, so I do ERP. It's not that. No, no, absolutely. Um, all right, so quick change of lanes. So 20-year-old um, self, if you could pick up the phone and call him, what would you tell him? Good question. So this is probably going to sound a bit like a cliche, but I think I would say be yourself. Um, it, this, this links up with just a lot of what we've been talking about, but I think one thing that I've struggled with in my life is like how to like figure out who I am and like be that person in my life in a way that feels natural to me. And I know this sounds like such a cliche and that like everyone's struggling with that in their twenties, mm. but I think being myself would have helped me a lot when I was 20 and I'm still working on that now, but I actually think that's like the best advice I could give most of my patients too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. And I, it's definitely something that I had to work on and still am but i have one friend who from when i met him when he was like 17 he was just always able to be himself and to me looking at him i've always admired it it's like a superpower he just he just doesn't care and i don't mean in a bad way he's just is who he is and it's it's unbelievable and it's uh, there's not many people i've ever met like that so i'm so jealous of those people yeah me too um so you've got a billboard what do you want written on it Yeah. I mean, I think it might be that it might be, be yourself. You know, I, I think about if not to take it off your question, but if you had be yourself as your billboard and then the question is, well, how do you do that? I actually think a lot of exposure therapy mm -hmm. is about learning how to be yourself. Meaning, I mean, if you think about it more from an act fap lens, it's, putting yourself in situations that scare you and then finding who you really are in those situations, yeah. finding uh, a natural way to be in those situations that fits who you are. And I actually think like that would have served me well at 20. It serves me now. I'm constantly coming back to who do I want to be in this moment? Hmm. Yeah. Re really good point. Uh, and then lastly, is there anything else that you wish you could have said today? Hmm. Well, you know, there's so much more to say about FAP and all yeah. of this, but I think the one thing is if there are clients out there or clinicians out there who are wanting to do more of this in their therapy, um, like we were saying before, this isn't like you can go to the ACT website and find an ACT therapist or go to like the IOCDF website and find an ERP therapist, you can definitely look for people who are trained in fat, but there isn't as much out there. Like I said, it hasn't really caught on yet, but I think what people can do is just start thinking more flexibly and broadly about what is driving my OCD. Is it really just this content that I'm worried about or is, are these process things going on too? these interpersonal things going on? Mm -hmm. Some of the examples I gave may resonate with people. And then you could bring that into your sessions with your therapist and say, I think I've got a problem with vulnerability, or I think I've got, you know, I find myself really afraid of what you think of me to the, the therapist and get off the content of your OCD and focus more on some of these other things that may be driving it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Re really good idea. Um, okay. So thank you so much. This has been a naturally reinforcing conversation for me. <laughs> Awesome. I'll throw that in. Um, but no, I really appreciate it. And it's great to finally have shared uh, that with the world uh, in the psychological sense, not in the other sense. Just don't Google it. Um, and yeah, I think going back to your other question, it's never come up. So it's not something that even got talked about in any of my trainings here in the UK. Never, it would never even got mentioned once. Maybe because we have, 
I think similar versions here in the UK, but even so, um, I'm pretty sure none of my guests or people with OCD that shared their story on the episodes have talked about it. It's yeah. So maybe it does come down to a marketing thing, but, um, I just, that just came to me and I thought I'd share it, but thank you so much for, for giving me your time today. That was one of the reasons I wanted to do it is because I wanted to get it out there. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD visit go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care.